بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful, may God's peace and prayers be showered unto all of his prophets, starting from Prophet Abraham, through Prophets Moses, Jesus, and Prophet Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Your Excellency, Dr. Mahathir bin Muhammad, and Mrs. Dr. Mahathir bin Muhammad. Ladies and gentlemen, and our brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. God's peace and prayers be upon you. On behalf of many of the Muslim communities, I've had the honor to serve throughout the United States and Canada. I'd like to express how privileged we are to have you, Your Excellency, and Mrs. Mahathir come to Chicago. We wished that you would come to Los Angeles and we would have shown you what we can do in our backyard, but we are here in the house of God and every house of God is our house and our backyard. We are honored to be here in the house of God. I was sharing with His Excellency the reason we have chosen to hold these proceedings in a masjid, in a mosque. We believe, and I firmly, personally believe, that many of the difficulties the Muslim countries have today is that the intellectual leaders and the professionals have left the masjid, the mosques, and ran to the hotels and a vacuum was created and it was filled up by those who are not as intellectual and as qualified to lead and hence misrepresent this great religion of love, of compassion, of respect to all human beings regardless of their skin color, of their faith or national origin. We thank Dr. Ahmad al-Munasir very much for allowing us in and we thank the brothers and sisters in the community here who have allowed us in. One other reason we have made the decision to hold the proceedings here in this masjid is I know how dear Bosnia is to the heart of you and your excellency. I happened to be in Bosnia when you had the big fundraiser And I have seen you crying and weeping when you were delivering your speech. And I wept too. We thank you for your leadership, for your support. And may God bless you and your wife and your family, inshallah. This masjid was built by the immigrants who came after the demolish, the demise of the Ottoman Empire in 1917, 1920. And they started working in America, and I was very honored this evening to meet their children. Three of them actually are police officers who are on security details. Can you raise your hands? I can see you. Shaban's son, are they here? They are not here, they are probably outside. So there is a new breed of American Muslims who are going to make a difference in America, who are proud to be Americans and honored to believe in La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah and compassionate and respectful to all other faith and all other people. What is Islamic banking? We use the American vocabulary and we call it socially responsible asset-based financing that believes in community development, community reinvestment, micro lending, equal lending opportunity to all people, regardless of their ethnic background, skin color, gender, or national origin. It prohibits speculation and gambling with people's assets and trusts. It is, in fact, a morally and ethically responsible banking and financing system. 
Your Excellency, American Finance House, Lariba, is an independent finance company established in California in 1987 to offer financing in accordance with the Islamic jurisprudence. We call it Lariba, which means no riba. But for those who do not know about it, we have a very interesting story. We say L means loss, A means Angeles, R means reliable, IB investment, B means bankers, and A is associates. So we are the reliable, the, the Los Angeles reliable investment bankers associates, or La Riba, which means no riba. And we're very, very delighted to present the concept to all people of all faith. We've been offering Islamic financing in accordance with the Islamic jurisprudence methods to the community at large, Muslims and non-Muslims. By the way, we have people of the Jewish faith as our clients, of the Christian faith as our clients, of the Hindu following as our clients. We have served people of all faith, and it was formed by a group of highly accomplished American Muslim businessmen and businesswomen. We did not go hand in hand looking for help because we think that we are big boys and girls. We have worked very hard to make it here in America. Our capital and investment resources are all from our community and we rely on our community resources. The company has a book authored by myself entitled La Riva Bank and the book was published twice and we have distributed so far 7,000 copies. And our company is now serving 13 states in the United States, in Arizona, California, Colorado, Florida, Georgia, Illinois, Maryland, Massachusetts, Michigan, Minnesota, New Jersey, Texas, and Virginia. The company offers financing of single family homes, small businesses, fast food franchises like Kentucky Fried Chicken, Church's Chicken, and Baskin Robbins. In California, you can go and have halal Kentucky Fried Chicken, and we're very proud of that. Medical clinics, many medical clinics and dental clinics, gas, gas stations, car washing facilities, and trade financing. And the sweetest of all, and we thank Allah for it, is that we've been profitable and distributed competitive dividends and profits since we started. And this is because we firmly believe in a very important banking rule, and that is know your clients. We know each and every one of our clients in all these states. We call our company lariba.com, and it is the only company in the United States of this type. Alhamdulillah, American Finance House Lariba has become one of the most recognized name brands in Islamic banking and finance, both in the United States and abroad. The Los Angeles Times, which has a circulation of 1.4 million, covered our company operations in a front page article. To my knowledge, and I lived in the United States for 32 years, the first ever positive article on Muslims that comes on the front page. And we're very thankful to Allah for it. Other newspapers that presented lengthy articles about Lariba.com were the Houston Chronicle, the Dallas Morning News, the Chicago Tribune, and the Detroit Free Press. In addition, American Finance House Riba was shown on ABC Nightly News Worldwide with Peter Jennings. And we were really surprised because all of these acknowledgements were never solicited. We just get a phone call or a knock at the door and people say, would like to talk to you about what you are doing, which is another proof that good deeds and good work never are wasted. Inna Allah la yudiyoman ajraman ahsan amala. Allah will never waste the reward of those who do the good deeds. We also had interviews with National Public Radio at the University of Urbana, Illinois, and we are thankful to Allah. We also were honored to be invited to present papers at the annual Islamic Banking and Finance Symposia held at Harvard University in 1998, 1999, and this year. And our company has become a true dot-com company. 
We don't have offices in any of these states. Every morning we walk in the office and we thank God we get at least four applications. Our website is visited by about 175 guests every night. This is a banker's dream come true. And we're very, very delighted because we never advertise. It is all done by a word of mouth because of the kind of service that we have been offering, the kind of ethical relationship that we develop with our clients. What is our vision? We have ambitious long-term plans to develop a network of banks in America that offer a Lariba window. I hope that God will give us the strength and the support to see a Lariba Islamic banking window like Malaysia did in every bank in the United States. And we're working on it, Your Excellency. And we pray and pray with us that we will achieve. We also aspire to offer our services next to every community center, church, temple, and masjid. A number of significant steps have been taken towards achieving that goal. Every year, American Finance House Lariba Board of Directors has a special meeting to review the developments of Islamic banking in the previous year and go through a name list of significant contributors to the field of Islamic banking or significant achievers in the field of entrepreneurial success that we can offer to our young men and women, our children, as role models to emulate in America so we can be proud of our American young men and women. Last year, we honored a Harvard active worker, Professor Tom Mullins, who started the Islamic Finance Program at Harvard University. And we also honored another person who works for Hong Kong Shanghai Bank, and all the names of the honorees are in the list. But one prominent name came up, and that name was His Excellency, the Prime Minister Mahathir Mohammed. And we were puzzled how we can do it. We said that what His Excellency has done for Malaysia and the world far exceeds what any of us have done in our humble efforts in Islamic banking and finance. So, the Board of Directors of American Finance House, Lariba, has decided to be honored to offer you, and you have accepted gracefully, the Lifetime Achievement Award, the Lifetime Lariba Achievement Award, that is only reserved for significant achievers, and we are honored for you to be the first recipient of that award, Mr. Prime Minister. Please join me in congratulating the Excellency for this award. I'll go back to July 1997. The Malaysian currency, the ringgit, came under a speculative attack along with the currencies of many of the so-called Asian tigers at the time, like the Thai currency and the South Korean currency. At the time, you could exchange one dollar for two and a half ringgits. After the attack, you can exchange one dollar for 4.8 ringgits, and that was in April 1998. The Kuala Lumpur Stock Exchange was around 1,000 before the attack of the currency traders, and it reached 280 in September 1998. Just imagine that tomorrow, I mean Monday, a Tuesday, you go to your work and you hear that the stock market, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, just come down from 11,000 to 2,800. I'm 100% sure that 95% of those in this room have mutual funds. Your $2,000 investment would go down to almost $200, 10 to 20 cents on the dollar. The gross domestic production was growing in Malaysia for 10 years till 1996 at 8.5% until 1998 when it shrank by 7.2%. The Ministry of Finance and the Central Bank, Bank Negara, at the time, 
did not understand what was happening. I called my friends in, in Malaysia and I said, hey, you know, do something. The Thai central bank has been pouring dollars in the market and losing dollars in the market. They lost their reserves. Do something. Don't follow their example. The surrounding countries poured most of their foreign currency reserves in the currency market to defend their currencies because that's what they read in the books. They didn't know how to do it. They don't have green span to take care of them. And not only this, but they went to the International Monetary Fund to borrow more money to pour in the market to defend their currency. And the International Monetary Fund gave them what I call the standard painful medicine given to all countries. Malaysia, under the leadership of His Excellency, the Prime Minister Dr. Mahathir Mohammed, had two courses of action to choose from. The first course of action was the International Monetary Fund recommendations that were subscribed to by the Malaysian Ministry of Finance and the Malaysian Central Bank, the so-called expert. And this included the following, and it's a recipe for disaster. Number one, raise interest rates. Number two, borrowers, honorable, honorable borrowers that borrowed money to help work the economy and make a nice living were forced to pay their debts faster despite the economic downturn. Third, the Malaysian government is required to reduce its support and subsidy of the economy. Fourth, Malaysian banks were asked to make borrowing more difficult instead of helping those who want to develop. And the government and the central bank were asked not to interfere with the culprit, the reason of the problem and that is the international free markets, especially the currency markets. This was tried briefly, but was proven to be a disaster for the Malaysian economy, and it was for the surrounding country. Businesses failed, construction activity and automobile sales and export-import financing, the backbone of the economy, all declined sharply. And by the way, for those of you who live in the United States, the real estate market is subsidized by the United States government because that's the backbone of the economy. And the automobile markets are also subsidized by the United States government, up and down depending on the flywheel effect, as we say. Real estate, business banking and networks, real estate in Malaysia, as it was in Thailand, banking networks, huge banking networks, and businesses could be purchased for almost 20 to 30 cents on the dollar. Everyone thought that Malaysia is ready to succumb, to go to the IMF to borrow and capitulate to the IMF demands. I was in Malaysia in 1998, visiting a friend of mine by the name of Nur Muhammad Yaqub, who is a brilliant Malaysian monetarist. I looked outside the window from a high-rise building at the beautiful seen in the skyline of the city of Kuala Lumpur. If you haven't been there, please do, because you'd be proud of the achievement of this honorable man that we are honored to have. I said, Noor, do you believe that these people want to buy all of this beauty for 10 cents on the dollar? You must be crazy. And we prayed that Allah will never allow this to happen, and we are thankful to Allah that it did not happen. The Prime Minister came in the picture, and I wish, I wish, that a good public relations firm from Los Angeles developed the story of what the Prime Minister and his team did so that the average layman in Malaysia and the developing countries can understand the significance of what the PM and his new team have done. This is in layman language. First, he wanted, like any good doctor, we heard that he's a medical doctor. Like any good doctor, he wanted to fix the ailment of his sick patient. He wanted to understand what was going on. What was the ailment and how the system works. And he assembled a fresh team of able advisors and together they, they dissected the situation. They understood how they could stop currency and stock market speculations at their heels. 
They followed a very bold course of action that was pioneering and exactly opposite to the advice given by the so-called experts and the international monetary funds. In America, we define an expert as a person who lives, who lives 100 miles away from home. So they live thousands of miles away from Malaysia. They made borrowing easier. This is what they did. They made borrowing easier so they can expand the economy. They gave more breathing space to those honest borrowers who could not pay their debts because of the crisis. They stimulated the construction industry, automobile industry, and export industry through easier terms for financing. And people started buying, and the economy started buzzing. They fixed the ringgit at 3.8 ringgit to the dollar. Not tied to the dollar, but tied to the surrounding countries' exchange rate in the Philippines and Thailand of an exchange of 1 to 10. And this helped the Malaysian exports to be less expensive and imports to be more expensive. They stopped currency and stock market speculation by devising brilliant policies only after he, the Prime Minister, understood how the system works. The International Monetary Fund and the G7 countries were up in arms. They criticized the policy and predicted its failure. And the Prime Minister and his team put their trust in God. There's a hadith by the Prophet وسلم, which he says, First think about it and then tie it and then put your trust in Allah and that is what His Excellency has done. And proceeded along a new monetary and economic policy that was never tried before in the world. Today, the Malaysian economy is back to normal and we congratulate Malaysia and Your Excellency without borrowing from the International Monetary Fund and without losing its reserves. The ringgit is at 3.8 ringgit to the dollar and many think it is actually undervalued. Currency and stock market speculators quitted speculating against the ringgit. I personally attended an interesting lecture by Mr. Soros who, were com who was complaining about capitalism because he lost a ton of money when he speculated against the Russian bonds. Maybe a higher authority was taking care of that. <laughs> Currency and stock market speculators quitted speculating against the ringgit. The Kuala Lumpur Stock Exchange is now included back in the Morgan Stanley Index. Foreign direct investment is back investing in Malaysia. And the Kuala Lumpur Stock Exchange, for those who took the bold step of investing in Malaysia, went up from 262 at its low to about 800. And we congratulate all of those who invested in the Malaysian stock market at that time. And the economy is back in action. The new chief of the International Monetary Fund, a recognized German banker, not only congratulated Malaysia for the success of its bold policy, but also is now implementing a similar approach. All distinguished universities in the world are teaching the Malaysian policy as a new case study for its students in monetary policy. I want to share with you an interesting thing. The word doctor in the Islamic culture means they actually don't use the word doctor. They use hakim. In Hebrew it is hakam. That's the word. And hakim means the wise person. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Holy Quran says, وَمَنْ يُؤْتَ الْحِكْمَةَ فَقَدْ أُوْتِيَ خَيْرًا كَثِيرًا Those who have been granted the gift of wisdom, they have been granted the best of all gifts. So the hakim or the wise man Prime Minister Dr. Mahathir Mohammed was the wise Hakim captain that was not afraid of saying, I do not know what's going on and how the system works. Many people in his place would be proud not to say, I don't know how the system works. Was honest to say, I want to learn. Was wise to listen and to devise solutions and was bold and pioneering a new course of action and policy. Was courageous to stand by himself against the world. 
of the so-called experts and was humble enough to get down in the trenches and apply the policies with a hands-on approach along with his team of experts. Your Excellency, Mrs. Mahathir Muhammad, ladies and gentlemen, there is a beautiful verse in the Holy Quran which always captures my imagination. It is in chapter 56, verses 10, 11, and 12. It says, وَالسَّابِقُونَ السَّابِقُونَ أُولَٰئِكَ الْمُقَرَّبُونَ فِي جَنَّاتِ النَّعِيمِ And the pioneers, the pioneers, are indeed the ones who will be closest to God to enjoy the best parts of paradise. So Your Excellency, congratulations, because you are a pioneer, and you will be enjoying the best part of paradise, as promised by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your Excellency, on behalf of the shareholders, the board of directors, the staff, and many professional Muslims in America, I am pleased and honored to present you with the La Riba Lifetime Achievement Award. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in congratulating His Excellency, Dr. Mahathir Ben Muhammad, for this recognition. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. American Finance House, Lariba. The Lariba Lifetime Achievement Award to His Excellency Dr. Mahathir bin Mohammed, Prime Minister of Malaysia. In recognition of his leadership role in charting new courses in economic development, monetary policy, and multicultural and multi ethnic coexistence, particularly during the 1998 Asian Monetary and Economic Crisis, September 1st, 2000, Chicago, Illinois. 